hello and welcome back to another Before You Buy. And today I want to talk to you guys about Thunderbolt NAS. I want to tell you guys five things that you need to bear in mind before you go ahead and start spending some serious money on Thunderbolt NAS. Because a number of you might be going into this believing you're going to get results from it or get stuff from it that you're simply not. Or that you might be on the fence about Thunderbolt and these five points will help you understand why it's the right solution for you. So let's go ahead and go straight into the five reasons that you may or may not buy Thunderbolt right now. So now number one is to do with Thunderbolt over IP or IP over Thunderbolt, whichever way you want to look at it. Ultimately, it's about understanding the difference between a standard Thunderbolt external DAS drive or a you know hard disk like this one. This is the GTEC NVMe or utilizing a NAS with Thunderbolt. You have to understand that the difference between them in terms of performance is very, very important. Accessing a Thunderbolt NAS is actually slower than normal Thunderbolt. And a lot of that has to do with IP protocol. When you're connecting a standard Thunderbolt hard drive or Thunderbolt DAS externally, you are actually connecting with uh, a form of connectivity not dissimilar to that of USB. Just plug and play. Consequently, there's no real brains of the outfit going on. The Thunderbolt connection with the Intel drivers on your PC or Mac system and the Thunderbolt connection on your hard drive or SSD are doing all of the work automatically. It's all set by default. So when you connect it, you will get better speeds from a DAS. But Thunderbolt over IP uses IP protocol. There's a lot of uh, um, in, uh, addressing in place. And as you are communicating data between them, it is far more like connecting with a NAS. Consequently, the performance of Thunderbolt over IP is generally around 60 to 80% that, depending on the power of the NAS you're utilizing and the media inside, is about 60 to 80% the speed of traditional DAS. So whereas if you had an 8-bay, um, uh, eight hard drive base in a DAS, such as you know the Drobo D800 or stuff like that. If you connect that eight bay via Thunderbolt to a PC or Mac system, you're going to easily get fourteen to sixteen hundred thousand, uh, fourteen to sixteen hundred megs very, very easily from that hard drive array. But from a NAS array hard drive, uh, you got all those eight drives. You are going to get somewhere like a thousand to maybe twelve hundred if you're lucky, because of the drag factor of Thunderbolt over IP. And once you start looking at SSDs, you start looking at NVMEs, you will notice the disparity between Thunderbolt over NAS and Thunderbolt to DAS being greater and greater each time. So bear in mind, Thunderbolt over IP is incredibly convenient from a workflow perspective, but you will not get the speeds of Thunderbolt over IP or IP over Thunderbolt that you would get on a DAS. Next, T2E, or Thunderbolt to Ethernet. That is another big advantage of Thunderbolt to NAS that I think gets largely overlooked. And, you know, very much those 10 GBE users, you guys get a lot from this as well. Now, if you connect your PC or Mac system via Thunderbolt to a NAS with a supported Thunderbolt port, you can also get internet and network through that connection. Now, I'm getting a bit caveman about this, but in the briefest sense, the idea is that if you have a 10 GBE network or a wider network environment that's got a LAN connection, and again, 10G is optimal here, if you connect your PC or Mac system into the Thunderbolt NAS, which in turn is connected to another network environment, not only will you be able to access the contents of that NAS over Thunderbolt, but the rest of the wider network will also come through the NAS and into your PC or Mac system with the utilization of T2E, Thunderbolt to Ethernet. Now, if you're running a 1G network, who cares? You're going to be getting that over practically Wi-Fi anyway. You're going to get close enough at 60 or 80 megs. But Thunderbolt to Ethernet, if you're utilizing a 10G environment, so you've got 10G computers over there connected to a 10G switch, which is connected to this 10G NAS. If you're connecting your PC or Mac to Thunderbolt on that NAS, you're going to get access to the 10G network as well. And if you're running a high-end internet connection, if you're one of those lucky people in the regions where your internet is a, is a joke how fast it is, and you're funneling that into a 10G network, that will also pass through to your PC or Mac system, which, you know, I've got two systems here behind me. One of them's got Wi-Fi 6, so 2,400 um, megabits if I'm lucky, so 240 megabytes. 
it, 10G upscale from that is fantastic. It's not that easy to upgrade a device like this to Thunderbolt there or 10GVE without an adapter taking up that connection. So T2 is another great way in which you can you know, maximize your investment in a Thunderbolt NAS by upgrading devices that are not really getting higher than 100 megs connection if they're lucky to have access to a 10G network as well as a Thunderbolt NAS for editing. And that's another way in which you can reinvent your workflow with a Thunderbolt NAS. The next thing to bear in mind is of course the expense. Thunderbolt NAS is probably one of the most expensive variants of NAS within its own sub uh, classes that you can buy. And it's several reasons for that. Firstly, let's go with the proprietary reason. There aren't a lot of Thunderbolt NASs out there, and the ones that are, are almost all, we are talking 9 out of 10, owned by QNAP. They pretty much have done all the work on this. They have refined this in a significant number of ways, and they pretty much own the marketplace on this, and they put a lot of funds, be it R&D, be it marketing, whatever you want to call it, into this endeavor. Consequently, because they're the only ones that have got it, they do tend generally to charge the most for it. But that's not the only reason. You need a lot of good hardware for a decent Thunderbolt solution. You may notice that pretty much all Thunderbolt enabled NAS solutions also have 10G on board, thanks to that T2E stuff we just talked about. Consequently, those systems, because they're Thunderbolt and 10G, those are two things that a lot of standard class 1G NASs simply don't have. And even if you're not gonna use 10G on the NAS, you've still got to pay for it because it's there. So that's another way in which the price increases. But another key area is to do with CPU and memory. CPU and memory are the things that keep the data flowing, be it within a client app sense or just general throughput throughout the device with read and writes. And Thunderbolt is a hungry beast. Anyone that's ever connected a Thunderbolt cable to their PC or Mac system and then opened up the task manager or resource monitor will notice that Thunderbolt is a hungry beast. These days, between Thunderbolt sapping your GPU and CPU and memory and Google Chrome sitting there eating up your memory like it's a buffet, the, between those two devices, you notice your task manager going nuts, even doing basic tasks and with these more powerful NAS systems on the other side of things the NAS needs to have a decent CPU and a decent amount of memory to really take advantage of Thunderbolt be it with T2E or standard Thunderbolt NAS connectivity. Consequently you, that's why you very rarely and I do mean rarely see a NAS with Thunderbolt that is less than a Pentium. There was one example that didn't that was the Celeron base 453B T3 and the read-write performance on that was pretty terrible compared to the others. Also, you're going to need at least 8 gig of memory to really take advantage of Thunderbolt. Anything less than that. And then you've, you're kind of nipping at the toes of the system utilization as well. And Thunderbolt is just not going to pass through that. Common CPUs in the current generation are your Intel i3, i5. And I think there's a sneaky little i7 on a Horizon 8th gen. But also, there's that Xeon W1250 processor it's a gpu equipped xeon and that's another key element you find that cpus inside thunderbolt nas are almost always embedded graphics because the in uh, the intel thunderbolt drivers and all that kind of thing they are hungry for that so bear in mind you are going to have to get a cpu that's got embedded graphics which will almost always affect the price as well so thunderbolt nas not the cheapest beast uh, those are the key reasons for that Next thing to bear in mind if you are going to buy a Thunderbolt NAS, and this is moving slightly, slightly away from the NAS system itself, and it's more about your client devices, your PC, your Mac, your MacBook, your tablet, your XPS, or whatever it is that you're running. If you are going to be utilizing a Thunderbolt NAS for you know video editing, photo editing, and there are a you know there is a myriad of different uh, softwares out there to you know handle this kind of editing in post-production or live recording, bear in mind that in order to interact with the data on a NAS, it is not as straightforward as plug and play, as mentioned. It's not just about performance. You can't just connect a Thunderbolt NAS and then it goes, boop, 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 boop. what do you want to do with this drive? Do you want to knock around with some files? It's not. It has to be set up with IP, and then after that, you can create saved pathways to the device, and the most common ones are utilizing iSCSI, so creating something called a LUN, uh, an iSCSI LUN target, or you can map a network drive. So these two systems are ways in which your PC or Mac will have 
you know, your internal drive, your C drive or whatever. And then after that, there'll be another drive that is the connected Thunderbolt NAS. But some softwares don't like that kind of protocol. Either they won't allow you to point the software at that mapped drive or iSCSI target, or you'll point at it, but they every time you try to interact with it, the software will report a problem. So make sure before you buy a Thunderbolt NAS that the software you use predominantly, the reason you're buying the Thunderbolt NAS supports iSCSI targets and or mapped network drives. Definitely the first one more, if I'm honest, because if it doesn't support that, you're not going to be able to interact with that Thunderbolt NAS in any way near close to the way you want to interact with it. So currently, Final Cut Pro's fine, Adobe, you know, Premiere, that sort of thing. Even some of the low-level stuff out there, Mavavi, um, even Paint.net and Photoshop, they support those services. But there are still lesser ones out there that don't. And a lot of the reason they don't support it is a lot of the fluidity and speed of that software is based on pre-designated default pathways that the data and the libraries and the archives have to live. So they can't afford to change things up internally because it will make the software slow. But conversely, it means that you can't use a Thunderbolt NAS for that. So bear that in mind before you make the jump into Thunderbolt NAS. Finally, this is probably one that a lot of you know, and it's one of the versatile factors of Thunderbolt NAS, but it is a flipped coin. It is a double-edged sword. There are two sides to this. That is multi-user access to a Thunderbolt NAS. Thunderbolt NASes allow multiple users to connect to the same storage array and edit at the same time. Now, traditional DAS drives and standard Thunderbolt connectivity drives don't allow that. They allow one person to interact with the drive at any given time, and then it's disconnected, and someone else can. There are ways around it, but ultimately that is the way they are built. Now, with Thunderbolt NAS, on the other hand, uh, Thunderbolt NAS such as the 872XT, or perhaps some of the newer gen stuff like the 1688X that can have up to four connected Thunderbolt users at once, as well as 10G users and 2.5 GPU users is quite beneficial. It means everyone can edit the files at the same time. Now, there are the questions about what happens if two people edit the same file at once. And luckily, lots of software does support something called NLE, non-linear editing, which allows copies of the files to be edited and then sent back to the system. And thanks to versioning built into NASes, you can still revert to older file types. So there are provisions for that. But bear in mind, just because you're using a Thunderbolt NAS as a reported speed of 12 to 1500 megabytes per second, and you are using the most top end hard drives out there, bear in mind, that all of those users accessing the same storage pool at the same time means the performance will likely be shared between them. So a vague example, if one user was getting a thousand megs, say their array was four or six drives or something, if two users access it, it doesn't necessarily mean that all of a sudden they get 500 each. They are going to get kind of sporadic read writes based on a kind of load balance turn management of access to that files so you're going to get very sporadic read write everyone can access it at once and they're still going to get good speeds on the whole definitely better than a standard connected DAS and particularly good when everyone's accessing the same uh, repository of data but bear in mind that in a Thunderbolt NAS multi-user environment they're not all going to get a thousand each that's not how it works it's going to be not evenly shared out, but everyone's going to get a little bit less as the system resources have to start juggling all these different users at any given time. But this has been, or I think, are the five most important things to bear in mind before you buy Thunderbolt NAS. If there's stuff that I've missed or experiences you've had, maybe points that you think are pertinent for other users, bung them in the comments. We might do a follow-up video later in 2021. But if you have enjoyed this video, click like. If you want to learn more, click subscribe. And I will see you next time.